Hello everyone, I hope you're all having a wonderful day today. Hey, this is Akizio here, and, er, and this will be part two of my reaction to Vampire the Masquerade the Clans, All You Need to Know and More, by the Burger Krieg. I hope you guys enjoyed it watching part one. And, and if you're here and haven't seen part one, I, and I'd recommend watching that first. Also, sorry for the delay, a things happened and did I intended to do this like two days ago but better better two days late than two weeks so without further ado let's continue <laughs> and Sumitsi, also known as the fiends or the old clan represents the classic Eastern European Dracula style vampire with a bit of a twist. Probably the most inhuman of all the clans. They don't even hate like regular living mortal people anymore. They I have heard that what Clan Zumitsi does that they basically make like weird flesh monsters out of people. Like, like I, I don't know, like, like they do like like some like Ika. It, some things that things that be reminiscent of John Carpenter's The Thing, you know, like some like some body horror level stuff to people, and making abominations just... and monsters. And I've also heard that they can. A friend told me they can turn you into furniture, but keep you alive, so you're in constant agony torture and deform them for pleasure. To continue an earlier analogy, the Tumitsi are sort of the Toreador of the Sabbat, the great philosophers of sadism, who are solely focused on the question of what it means to be vampire. Because they don't really care about you. Philosophers of sadism. So a dark Eldar? Humans all that much, they tend to embrace absolutely massively exceptional people who just happen to strike their fancy at that particular moment. In order to maximize the potential of kindred, because that's all that humans are to them, is just like little seeds that maybe or maybe not could have potential in some way to actually build something worthwhile out of, they have instituted centuries-long breeding programs to get the traits that they find most interesting. Yeah. Oh, so va vampire eugenics. This is how bad they are. And to be clear, eugenics is one of the least of their crimes. Being a, a very traditional clan that cares a lot about their own history, the Tsumitsi are known to be very, very polite and hold especially the lords of hospitality in almost religious regard. This is, of course, primarily mm. because they are complete sociopaths who are fully on the orange and blue morality spectrum, and these kinds of very strict rules are the only thing that keeps them together. The clan has access to the disciplines animalism, which is control over animals, dominate, which is mind control, and protein, which in their case is the ability to shape flesh. In a time where disciplines were not design efficiency to death, this was called vicissitude, and it's the main standout ability of their clan that they will physically change themselves and others, usually more others in more horrendous ways, but they also change themselves to be whatever they want to be, often going very far away from the human form. And this is now an amalgam power of Dominate and Protea. The clan bane is called Grounded, and it used to be that they needed to sleep surrounded by their own grave soil. But in V5, they changed this into something that I personally think is a lot cooler, in that now they need to sleep surrounded by something that is ironically a very core aspect of like their their mortal identity that they used to have like their particular castle or maybe their ethnic group could still be grave soil by the way this also kind of means that the Tsumitsu don't really travel all that much it's a bit of a logistical challenge the clan compulsion is covetousness which is also a clan you know i am i am i would i would not be surprised if it turns out there are some Zemitsi who who did who did something like like there there are stories of is is of of like some some nobles like noble lords like family ca castle getting moved to a location like they should brick by brick and I'm just imagining in like 
like like like, like potentially the Zamiti doing something like like the older ones and figuring out how to move entire castles and homes homes in order to facilitate this sort of thing classic vampire thing to do where they like see something that they really 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 want for themselves and they will go to great lengths is ironically a very core cool aspect of like their their mortal identity that they used to have like their particular castle or maybe their ethnic group could still be grave soil by the way this also kind of means that the Tsumitsu don't really travel all that much it's a bit of a logistical challenge the clan compulsion is covetousness which is also a classic vampire thing to do where they like see something that they really 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 want for themselves and they will go to great lengths to get it it's amazing so oh well that thing looks like a jabberwocky but i was gonna say that um a that the coveted covetousness yeah i guess the magpie idea actually that i mentioned last time for him about the Toreadors fits more for the Zamitsi then. Zamitsi Antediluvian is known as the eldest and though as members of the Sabat of course they are rather happy that this creature is no more, they do share its vision and even respect it sort of for going all the way into a direction of complete and utter inhumanity. A common saying among the Tsumitsi is that instead of having a beast and a remnant mortal soul inside of it, the eldest just had two beasts. Some notable to Bart include Sasha Vikos, who has turned themselves completely androgynous and is a very radical member of the Sabat, known as their chief torturer. Radu Bistri, who used to be the Prince of Bistritz and is now a high-ranking member of the Sabat, himself originating in one of those breeding programs. And of course, yes, the Count Dracula, who actually is a master of Koldunic sorcery, which is an even older form of magic that the Tsumitsi had access to before they adopted vicissitude. It's basically like an Avatar The Last Airbender style spirits of the land element bending. The young and self interest If I heard them heard that the uh in in a uh... In spe in the that in that primer on on the supernatural that Speaker D and the others at at, at Ogre Poppinang did mentioned that that yeah Dracula is real and the vampires hate him because him because of well you know how how much into the public eye I think it was that he ended up bringing the idea of vampires. Interested clan Hakata, also known as the Lazarines or the Clan of Death, represents the archetypal vampire who is a corpse. Now the thing about the Hakata is that they're less a clan than a bunch of blood. Aren't but but aren't but aren't we? I mean, they all corpses technically. Lines in a trench coat. They formed in the 21st century through a ritual called the Family Reunion, which united uh, the Giovanni, the Samedi, the Cappadocians, and many, many of their cousins. And because they are composed of so many different groups, they have very different practices for embrace because they didn't just completely shed their old cultures. But much of the core of Clan Hakata is made up of groups like the Giovanni, who used to actually take up this particular clan slot and earlier editions, or the Dunsterns, or the Putanescas, who are very old mortal families who would go through generation and generation and generation, and some of them would be embraced into the vampire aspect of the family. Be because they are, at this point, the only clan that is completely outside of any of the major sects or ideologies, they are a little bit insular. Family, though not necessarily blood anymore, and trust count for everything among the Hakata. And part of the reason for this is that they founded themselves as a self-defense thing, a last-ditch, desperate effort, because most of them got almost annihilated by the Second Inquisition. The clan has access to the discipline's Auspex, which is highly sharpened senses, Fortitude, which is supernatural toughness, and Oblivion, which they share with Clan La Sombra. But instead of being, you know, shadow bending or anything even remotely thematically related to shadow bending, it's necromancy. 
because of some obscure law technicality that says that both of these things are related th in the law. Like, not mechanically, they're just really completely different concepts, but because of some obscure thing in the law, they have to be put into one discipline. And so in practice, what you have is an oblivion that is actually two different disciplines with completely different abilities, but because of how the rules work, in theory, unless the GM, which is probably going to do this, forbids it explicitly, you can pick from the abilities of necromancy and shadow bending like willy-nilly, completely annihilating the identity of the trademark ability of two really cool clans. And my question is, was it worth it? Was it really that important to convey mechanically to players that these two concepts are related within the lore of the game? Or maybe was it too expensive to get another one of these beautiful icons you made? I just... I will say, you can, you can get an icon like that made, well, well, before all the inflation and whatnot happened recently, you could get you could get an icon that I made for like for like five bucks or ten bucks bucks a few years ago. I really don't get it, and it makes me mad. The clan bane is the painful kiss, which the kiss is a slang term for when a vampire bites and drains someone, which usually is a very pleasant experience for the victim. But in the case of the Hakata, it's even more excruciating than it should be. Now, it used to be that all these different bloodlines had... Well, and if I remember correctly, the... The, the, uh, the... The, the kiss involves... Well, so they, they they drain all the blood out of someone, and then the vampire puts a bit of their own blood in there, which is also part of why why the whole, you know, thinning of the blood thing with each generation. Their own little flaws, like the Samedi and the Cappadocians, they just straight up used to look like corpses. Or the Nagaraja had to consume the flesh of their victims in order to gain any sustenance. Oh, now I see. Which is interesting because this means they always have to kill the victim that they're draining and also it takes a while to do it. But what they did, and I promise you this is 100% just game design reasons, is they said, well, here because of through magic they now all have the Giovanni clan bane and the old ones are no longer a thing. Which, let me tell you, a lot of game masters do not like to run it that way. The clan compulsion that they commonly suffer from is kind of weird, but I think very cool. It's called morbidity and it's this very strong drive to investigate death. This could be diagnosing a medical problem with someone that they sense is dying, or it could be solving a murder mystery. The Hikata Antediluvian is the thing that unites them, mm. by the way, because though they are all... So it sounds... <clears throat> sounds like, like some of them would get really into forensics then various different bloodlines with different founders, they are all ultimately descended of Cappadocius. Another of the more kindred affairs involved antediluvians, Cappadocius was actually diabolized by Augustus Giovanni some time ago, which is why he used to count as the antediluvian of Clan Giovanni. Some notable Hikata include Isabel Giovanni, who has infiltrated every single one of the major sects into, like, very high positions at one point or another. Pochtli, the founder of the Peace and blood. I see what they mean by the whole corpse thing. Line who actually died in order to create the conditions that uh, led to the formation of the Hikata, and the Capuchin, who is the de facto political leader of the Hikata, and who may not even be one of their clan descended of Cappadocius at all. You know, with a name like the Capuchin, because like. Like, when I hear a capuchin, the first thing I think of is, uh, is the capuchin monkeys. The clandestine and isolated clan Banu Hakim, also known as the Asamites, or the clan of the hunt, represents the archetypal Orient-type vampire that is, like, from the Orient. That's, like, a thing. 
I mean, yeah, technically all vampire clans are from the Middle East because that was where the first city was located. I have a personal fascination with the Banu Hakim. I love them very much and they are sort of modeled after the historical assassins down to the idea that they lived in like a isolated mountain fortress called Alamut. And though they do kill people for money, their main intended role in vampire society is as a sort of law enforcement. This is also one of the main groups mm. that they like to embrace from specifically investigators because they have this drive to hunt down if you will the truth and a propensity for self-sacrifice for a higher cause they also like to get learned people scholars on board if they prove that they have a lot of dedication to what they do uh, over like an extended observation period they also kind of used to like not embrace women after Banu Hakim has been embraced they are subjected to a rigorous seven year training program followed by another seven years of indenture to their master and if they fail any of the test or if they show any amount of disobedience their master straight up just kills them probably involving diablerie too which is one of the reasons why the banu hakim have had a fairly strained relationship with the Camarilla at times because in the Camarilla that is considered the absolute worst crime a vampire could possibly commit. Hmm. You know, at first we mentioned that they're into, well, you know, oh, seeking the truth and vampire law enforcement. For a moment there I figured, well, okay, maybe the Camarilla would like them, but uh, since they're so big on diablerie, yeah. Also. Oh, the, oh, the, actually, never mind, I forgot what I was about to say. The clan has access to the discipline's blood sorcery, which is like the same thing that the Tremere have, the blood magic, celerity, which is super speed, and obfuscate, which allows them to become undetectable. In earlier editions, they kind of had three different loadouts for disciplines because they had a warrior, a vizier, and a sorcerer cased. Uh, and their thing wasn't the same discipline as the Tremere, they had their own thing. It did have a greater focus on like blood magic in the actual literal sense of controlling blood which in a vampire society you can imagine how scary that is their clan bane has changed a lot over the years for law reasons currently it is the overwhelming urge when they taste the blood of another vampire to diablerize that vampire because they are attracted fundamentally to the blood of evildoers that need to be punished and in a sense being a vampire Oh, I see. Pyre is such an unbelievable transgression against the natural order that it makes that irresistible to the Banu Hakim. Now it used to be That explains the dabblery then. Be that each of the three castes had their own little clan bane, but the one they all share You know, if, oh, if being a vampire is such a huge crime against the natural order, or er, and the and being that they you know, do the whole like Justice thing, ing ing it. I like. I, I wonder how often it comes up as an issue among among the Banu Hakim, im the the you know the need to dabblerize other vampires. Bad was that uh, their skin would grow darker with age. This is a real thing that used to be the case, and I guess someone at some point figured out. That <laughs> <laughs> this isn't like the best idea. <laughs> Is that Justin Trudeau when he put men? Oh, oh. I, I've, I've heard about. Oh, it, <clears throat> I heard of, heard of Justin Trudeau on, on more than one occasion, covering himself in black shoe polish. To do blackface to have like it's a little ever so slightly a little bit problematic in line with their bane is their compulsion to pass judgment if someone that they know or in their presence does something that they consider to be unethical they will feel an urge to drink from them to enact punishment by taking some of their blood which, of course, given that they're usually surrounded by vampires, would lead to the problematic situation of it triggering their clan bane. 
The Banu Hakim Antediluvian is a guy called Hakim. And the story that the Banu Hakim tell about him is that he basically embraced himself as a mortal by killing two immensely powerful vampires of the second generation as punishment for their corruption. Some claim that his goal is to exterminate all vampires, which is almost definitely not true, but it's a convenient way to say, oh, those damned foreigners. Some notable Banu <laughs> I see. Banu Hakim include Urshulgi, who rather recently awoke from Torpor and looked around, just immediately took control of the clan and said, hang on, who is this Islam guy and why are you worshipping him instead of Hakim? Repent your idolatry or you will be destroyed immediately, which has kind of led to a schism that is currently plaguing the clan where a lot of Banu Hakim sort of went to the Camarilla. Fatima al Fakadi, who for a time was one of their most effective assassins and probably the first woman to ever be embraced into the clan. And Montgomery Kirvin, who is a very young Sabat aligned or formerly Sabat aligned Banu Hakim, who through sheer luck in the early 1990s managed to become immensely powerful by diablerizing Mithras, the Ventru Prince of London. The nomadic and deceitful clan mm. Ravnos, also known as the Haunted or the Clan of Seekers, is supposed to represent the vampiric archetype of, uh, how do I say this? How do I best put this? They're gypsies. They're basically, oh. the idea is that they're gypsies that will sneak into your house at night and drink your blood. Look, you have to consider that the Vampire the Masquerade, the first book came out in 1991, cultural like sensitivities were a bit different back then. We're talking about like White Wolf, which even in 1994, which was a few years after Vampire came out, published this, World of Darkness Gypsies. That's the book where they had a real-life category of minority groups that they took and made them mechanically distinct magical beings, <laughs> like, distinct from humans in the same way that, like, vampires or werewolves or changelings are in the World of Darkness. So, so gypsies in World of Darkness are mages, then? Law. Which is like wild that they thought this was a cool thing to do even back then. But yes, the core of the Ravnos clan is of and traveling with usually the various different ethnic groups descended of the Roma. In the West at least, mm. like they're a whole different clan in India that basically has very little to do with the rest of the world. Especially the new edition. You know, just given... Like, given the stuff that the gypsies have been through, it's like... Oh boy. ...has changed a lot of the baggage that comes with this without having to retcon anything into, like, reframing them a little bit as trickster, daredevil-type people. And, like, just going away from ethnicity for a moment, those are really the preferred group that the Ravnos embrace from. Adrenaline junkies and, like, social outcasts that manage to make their own way in life. Trailblazers, unperturbed with the strict rules of polite society, who like to pull pranks every once in a while, have a good sense of humor, and want to use their eternal unlife to actually see something of the world. In other words, absolute legends. The clan has access to the disciplines. You know, given that Thor the Allfather was a vampire, in World of Darkness, I'm now imagining that Loki and other trickster deities in different mythologies may just have been members of Clan Ravnos. Animalism, which is control over animals, obfuscate, which allows them to become undetectable, and presence, which is alluring charisma. The latter two form the amalgam power called chemistry, which used to be actually a discipline that they had, along with fortitude. Once again, a change I'm not particularly happy with for blah 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 reasons we've already gone into, but basically chemistry allows them to create illusions to fool other people. Their clan bane is doomed, which is in no way evocative of what 
what that actually mechanically means, even though it makes sense in the law once again. And basically it means they need to sleep in a different location every night. Now I'm not talking like the other side of the room, but at least a kilometer away. Their common compulsion is hmm. to tempt fate, which really is- So in a way, if we're, so whereas by comparison, the Zemitsi, due to their, their whole thing, having, uh, end up not traveling too much, Ravnos vampires have to travel around at, on at least a bit. Which I guess is, I, I, ass, I assume that and that's based on the, uh, on the whole thing of the gypsies being, being nomadic, if I remember correctly is just the classic adrenaline junkie move of doing something extremely dangerous for no other reason than it would be cool. The Ravnos Antediluvian is called Zapatasura, but he's also known as Drakian, and he very notably woke up from Torpor in 1999, sending literally every single Ravnos in the entire world into a homicidal frenzy for a week. This obviously almost <laughs> entirely destroyed the whole clan. The overwhelming majority of Ravnos just died during this time. And like, they used incredibly powerful Eastern vampires, which are a different category of vampires called Quajin, uh, which are not even probably related to the vampires and Vampire the Masquerade. And wizards used a bunch of orbital satellite nukes to stop this guy from the just path of destruction he was cutting through India. Now you know why antediluvians can be kinda spooky. Some notable Ravnos include Khalil Ravana, who is deeply addicted to the act of diablery, Alexis Sorokin, an unparalleled master thief who is being hunted by the Camarilla, and Sinevea, a rather ancient Ravnos who prefers to spend her time mentoring younger groups of vampires and sometimes other supernatural beings, usually while pretending to not be a vampire at all. The devout and pestilential clan ministry, also known as the Corruptors or the Followers of Set, represents the kind of demonic vampire that is just evil and opposed to all things that are good and proper Christian stuff. It you know, with a name like Ministry, it, it's both quite ironic in ways, because, you know, oh, oh, the... the with the whole thing of in, with the church ministering to people, but also, it for some reason makes me think of of the Ministry of Truth from with, from nineteen eighty four. It functions as a sort of vampire church that puts out the official vampire religion, obviously, in their view. Uh, and it kind of functions in practice as like an anti-real church, which in oh, so I was right. It is religious. Just a vampire church and, and just anti, well, anti Christianity, I guess, since, uh, since church, if I remember correctly, it's, it's only called a church, church in, well, actually, no, because it's like the church of Scientology, but you get the idea. Instead of espousing virtues, espouses doing sin. And by that I mean like all of the sin. They don't just like indulging in extreme hedonism, but also actively annihilating the compassionate fabric of society. They are serious cultists. And those are also like the exact kind of people that they want in their clan for their embrace. They're usually mortals who are already involved with their splintered and fractured devil cults while they were alive. And also, you can become a follower of Set no matter what clan you're from, even as a vampire you can essentially convert. That doesn't mean that you like change your abilities and get a new clan bane, but you are fully accepted into the clan and will be taught their powers. The whole embracing evil and corruption and destructive hedonistic indulgence does actually have a religious purpose and that they believe that you need to go to the absolute limits of experience in order to be able to free yourself from the flesh prison that your soul is trapped in. And becoming a vampire for them is just the first step 
on that journey. And once you have achieved that, you'll be in some sort of like perverse nirvana state that they all want to achieve. This plays heavily into the various doomsday cult aspects that they also have. The clan has access to the disciplines Obfuscate, which allows them to become undetectable, Presence, which is alluring charisma, and Protean, which allows them to gain animal traits and transform into animals, here usually snakes. This discipline used to be called Serpentis, and it was- Snakes, you say? Considering that they're, well, and the, well, anti-virtue and all that, why do I feel... Well, well, given the reputation snakes have in Christianity, that also makes sense. ...was much more focused on, like, magic and magical aspects, but yet again, a whole clan's mechanical identity really needed to be condensed down into a single amalgam power. Honestly, if Vampire 5 didn't have the best hunger in humanity mechanics by, like, a light year of all the additions, I would despise it. The clan bane is that they absolutely abhor the light, and not just sunlight, but any bright light. Even like a full moon, you know, they don't- it doesn't hurt them specifically, but they find it very irritating. And if they ever are exposed to sunlight, it is especially damaging to them. Their clan compulsion is tra- So I assume that you'd find them doing this sort of thing where it's just- If they're somewhere, it's just pitch black room. Um, not no candlelight, no nothing. Just pure darkness. Transgression, which is about manipulating people into breaking their most sacred ethical and moral precepts, spreading corruption everywhere they go. The Ministry Antediluvian is none other than the Egyptian god Set, which is why most of the clan is situated in and around Europe and the general Maghreb sort of region. And the thing about Set is that he worships a, well, it's not even demonic anymore sort of entity that exists in the Great Void and all it wants to do is destroy and be evil and spread corruption. Some notable ministers include Kementiri, who is a corruptor so vile that the Camarilla created a whole slew of extremely powerful institutions just to hunt her down. Nefertiti- <laughs> It's like having your own- it Okay, so it's one thing to be hunted by, say, the Inquisition for being for being a witch. It's another thing to essentially have several vampire, like separate vampire Inquisitions after each one, and made only to hunt you specifically. That is, I I am I am honestly curious what she did to warrant that response. T.T., a very powerful, pure, unadulterated narcissist who sees herself as the rightful vampire queen of all of Europe, and she has managed to turn several animals, especially snakes, into vampires. And Hesha Ruha- I wonder what effect vampirism has on animals. Like, are they just still animals but, but vampire, or do- or- does it- or would it make them actually more intelligent for some reason? Because the idea of having a snake, something that bites pe- that, you know, that bites and is, in many cases, venomous, is be a vampire, sounds like an odd but interesting combination. Hadze, a scholar of the occult so renowned that his sire actually renamed himself into Abu Ruhadze, so like, the father of Ruhadze. Also, he has like a really cool monocle. And that's it. That's the 13 clans. There is also something called caitiff, which is vampires that don't know what their clan is. They sometimes have very interesting combinations of disciplines and are not really bound to the disciplines of their clan, which is sometimes the exact reason why their sire abandoned them. While that may sound very cool, bear in mind that caitiff are the absolute lowest of the low in vampire society. No one likes them, no one wants anything to do with them, it's not really advisable to play one. So there you go, even if before watching this you knew nothing about Vampire the Masquerade, now you have a functional 
basic knowledge of what you maybe should be aware of if you're going to play the game. There is a lot of VTM lore out there, and that isn't even touching on all of the other World of Darkness properties. Even the clans I mentioned have, like, huge swathes that I couldn't even begin to get into. If you found any of them particularly interesting, I highly recommend the White Wolf Wiki for further information. Or if you prefer video learning, I can recommend the Primogen's channel, who has a lot of in-depth videos on most of the clans. If oh yeah, I remember them. Um, um, I, I reacted to one or two of their videos. Good stuff. Would recommend. If you want to see how Vampire the Masquerade is actually played, check out LA by Night, which is an actual play podcast set in the California Anarch Free State, uh, with some tremendous characters played by very talented actors, and a game master that is so excellent, I personally count him among probably like the top five in the entire world for any system. They e Those are some high praises. Even have like a only recently embraced fish out of water, don't know what is going on type character, which is excellent because they explain to her a lot of the important things that are the case about the vampire world, so it's great for people who have no idea about the lore. And look, ultimately, while they may be interesting, it doesn't matter how much of lore you consume of Vampire the Masquerade, ultimately what the game experience is about around most tables is for it to be a game of personal horror. It's about your relationships uh, and your struggles with the vampiric condition, the political maneuvering inside a very rich and dare I say realistic world packed full of mystery. Thank you so much for watching this monstrous video. <laughs> like, comment, subscribe, <laughs> share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. Consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar, buying some of my merchandise or my short story collection. And in that spirit, boy, this was a long one. Probably the longest video I've ever done. I don't know why I did this. I woke up one morning and I decided, you know what? Dude, like, just take two weeks out of the video making schedule to work like a long, long time every day to get this done. And <laughs> this basically like suspended everything else in my life to do this. Uh, very, very strange, but I've, I've been enjoying it. So maybe if you like this sort of long form content, five people who are still watching this at the end of the video, leave a comment. And in that spirit, see you around, cunts. <laughs> well, well, I I must say it takes it takes passion for something to just to just wake up one well you know to just wake up one morning and decide it, that you want to spend two weeks working on something like this which it is it is definitely applaudable. And props to ups to Burger you or you guys you should def, should definitely check out his stuff. Oh, and I hope you guys enjoyed it watching with me. And if you did, I'd appreciate if you like, comment, and subscribe. And definitely show some love of the of the burger. Or a link to the original video will be in the description box below. And until next time, ta-ta!